I want to say I'm so, so excited today. I've been praying for this new sermon series, and I've been seeking the Lord in prayer, and I've been asking some questions to the Lord. And, and one of the things, I mean, there's no better place to start than by studying the nature of God. It all starts with God. The Bible says that in the beginning, God, amen, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So it all starts with God. And, and I think the, one of the questions, I mean, growing up, and I would always ask, because I don't know if you know this, but I love to ask questions. That's how I learned. And when I was little, many years ago, I would always ask, so what is God like? I would ask some deep theological questions like to my teachers, hey, do flies go to heaven? So I was never able to get that answer. You know, they, they didn't, oh, Oliver, come on, man. I don't, I don't know. So, but I would always ask those questions. But I'm really excited that today we're going to start this uh, new series that we have called God Is. And we're going to try to answer that or to complete that. We're going to be looking at several uh, attributes of God, you know, the nature of God. What is God like? But specifically today, I want to talk to those of you who are hurting. Maybe you are feeling a little afraid or maybe you feel alone. Or you are disappointed. You've been, uh, you know, you've been abandoned. You've been forsaken by some people you love. And maybe you're just worn out. And we just sometimes, we're just tired, right? There's so much things going on in, in the world and we're just tired. And, and maybe, I don't know, maybe you, you came this morning asking lots of questions. Maybe you're losing hope. Maybe you're starting to question your, your faith. But here's the thing. When we open the Bible, we discover that there's a lot of people that ask the same questions. They have the same doubt. They ask people. They ask the same questions. And there is a guy in the Old Testament. He was one of the prophets. And, and he, he, there's actually a book. I don't know if you knew this, but there's a, call, a book called Lamentations. Lamentations. Basically, he's lamenting to God. He's complaining. Question, have you ever complained to God besides me? Like, almost like every day? Like, have, you, have you ever asked the question, why God? Why me? Why me? I wanted to be like a little taller. God, why do you make my head so big? I always ask that question. Maybe my ears are too, uh, you know, different. Why do I need to wear glasses? I always ask that question. But there's a guy... And, and, and we found, you know, and if you feel worn out, maybe discouraged, maybe confused, maybe you're asking some question, well, there's hope. And I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Lamentations, chapter 3. And this is what the Bible says. I'm going to start in, verses, in verse 19. And this is one of the prophets, one of the servants of God. <clears throat> and he's saying these words. He said, the thought of my suffering and homeless, homelessness... Is bitter beyond words. Please pay attention to these words. And then he says, I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. Question, have you been there? Yet, he says, I still dare to hope when I remember this. And I want you to look at me. My goal today is that, is that you can call to mind this, uh, uh, you know, of the beautiful and the power, the powerful attributes of God. And, and I'm hoping that we will be able to find that hope, and especially when you are hurting. And this is, on, let's continue in verse 22. And the Bible says, the faithful love of the Lord never ends. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. And so here's our today's attribute. The faithful love of our Lord Never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. So that's why today I am so excited to talk to you about the mercy of God. About the mercy of God. And, and the, the title of today's message is Hope When You Are Hurting. Hope When You Are Hurting. I want to invite you to pray this time. Father, 
My prayer this morning is that, that you will give us hope through your word. Father, we, may we experience your mercy, your goodness, your grace, and your faithfulness. And be changed in your presence by the power of your word. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. And everybody says with me, amen and amen. So I want to ask you, if you're taking notes, I want to ask you to write this down. God's attribute is the mercy of God. The mercy of God. And this subject is honestly a lot more, how do I say it? It's a lot more complex than most people will think. Honestly, it's like there's a lot of layers of, uh, to every single attribute of God as we will see. And there's a lot of sometimes uh, overlap, but there's also a lot of distinction, distinction, I'm sorry. But also one of my goals as I preach this series is to bring one of the, you know, complex or complicated concepts of the nature of God. And I want to I wanna try, I want to do my best to just to try to make it simple for you guys. And one of the challenges that we, when we look at the, the attributes of God, I think a lot of people see him like, you know, they all kind of go all in, like they're all together and they kind of somehow overlap. Like there's like love and joy and there's mercy and there's goodness and, you know, God is just and he is faithful and he's full of grace, but he's also compassionate and all this stuff. And even, even though, I mean, all of that is true, also I want you to see that they are also very unique and quite different. For example... Today I want to give you three of the, the attributes of, or qualities of God that are closely really related, but they're actually very, very, very distinct. For instance, how do we define justice? Like what is justice? So simply defined, justice is, say it with me, when you get what you deserve. Can I get an amen? Justice is when you get what you deserve. So in our culture today, when someone does something horrible, something bad, so we usually, let's be honest, we tend to think, let justice be served. Amen? That's justice. Somebody gets what they deserve. But also, I want you to look at grace. Grace is when you get what you do not deserve. Grace is when you get what you do not deserve. Do Question, do any of you deserve salvation? We know that we don't. And, and, and the answer is no, and we don't deserve it, but we are saved by grace. And the Bible says that God gives us something that we do not deserve. And that, but that is different, my friends. That is different than mercy. Mercy is when you don't get what you do deserve. Is that clear? Mercy is when you don't get what you do deserve. And they are a little bit different. For instance, if we're honest, most of us like justice. We, we, we are for justice until it comes down to us. Right? We don't want justice with us. What do we want? Help me. We want mercy, right? We want mercy. We don't want uh, what we deserve. We don't want to get what we actually do deserve. We want other people to get justice. For instance, confession time. How many of you have ever gotten a ticket for driving too fast? Anybody? <laughs> really? So, are you, are you ready for a little confession from your pastor? Can, can I be honest with you guys today? So, unfortunately, your pastor has gotten several, several speeding tickets. Most of them in the beautiful land of Arkansas. So, I, I remember it was, uh, let's see. I'm not going to tell you how many tickets I got. And don't ask me that question. I can't, I can't tell you. I mean, I'm not going to tell you like five. I'm not going to tell you how I got them four or five. But here's the thing. I remember, uh, we used to live like 10 years ago in the little town of Peer Ridge, Arkansas. 
And uh, I don't know if you know something about small towns, but the police are very tough. And I don't know. I mean, I lived in that town for about 10 years, but uh, I, I mean, I forgot that, you know, <laughs> that when you drive through a school zone, uh, you know what I'm going with this, right? And I, like, you need to drive, you, you know, my drive like around 25. But for some I was in a hurry for some reason. I was driving 55. <laughs> Just being honest with you guys. I was late for some of, some of our meetings, you know, and I got pulled over. And then, uh, of course, I mean, the, the, the officer asked me, hey, sir, do you know what's going on? They said, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I was, I'm just, I was not paying attention, you know, I'm in a hurry, so just give me the ticket. So, yeah, I got a ticket, so, uh, and then I was supposed to go uh, to the city court in about, uh, I don't know, two weeks after that. So, and I remember, can you imagine your pastor, you know, I just uh, I woke up that morning, I had to go to court, so what, what do I do? I was like very, a little, well, not a little, I was very embarrassed. So I showed up, and it was packed, and I looked around, and uh, to my surprise, it was, it was full of a, a lot, many, I don't know why, but it, there was many Hispanic people in there. And I was just looking around, okay, so I'm a Hispanic pastor, so I'm just hoping nobody will recognize me. Thankfully, nobody knew me. <laughs> So anyway, we just went in there for a couple of hours, and then uh, the, the judge called my name, Mr. Oliver Martinez, and I was just, okay, so I just stood up, and he said, Mr. Martinez, I understand that you got a speeding ticket for driving 25 miles above the speed limit. How do you uh, plead? And uh, I was very, very embarrassed, and I said, well, I mean, your honor, uh, I just want to say uh, yeah, I'm guilty. I just feel so bad. I wasn't paying attention. I'm, yeah, I'm very, uh, you know, that was very irresponsible. I want to plead guilty. But then he randomly asked me, hey, question, do you speak Spanish? Um, yeah. Uh, and he said, well, here's the thing the judge said, and I'm not kidding. He said, I want to make a deal with you. So just look around here. I'm assuming many people here do not speak, uh, do not speak English. So if you stay for, if you, if you stick around for like two or three more hours, I'm willing to forgive your ticket, and this will not show on your record. Do you want to stand and help, help me out? So, yeah, of course, <laughs> of course. So long story short, I stayed, I translated for the rest of the court session, and I did not get a ticket. I, that did not show on my record, I said, absolutely, you can count on me. And the judge showed mercy on your pastor. Praise Jesus. Let's go home now. That's my story. <laughs> and so here's the thing. I, I really enjoyed that. I mean, I, I did not get what I deserved. I was being irresponsible. But the judge was being merciful to me. And, and let's be honest. We really... We really want justice for other people, right? We want justice for other people, but we tend to want mercy for ourselves. And God, this is the good news. Our God is a merciful God. He's not like you and me. He's a merciful God. And, and I want to show you, there's a text in the New Testament. I'm talking about Ephesians chapter 2 that, that is not, I'm going to be honest, it's not fun. In fact, it's not fun at all. And we see that the Apostle Paul Con contrast that our spiritual spiritual condition without God or without Christ, our nature without Christ, and he contrasts that with God's mercy. And this is what the Bible says in verse 1. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and many sins. In other words, so first, first of all, he says you are spiritually dead because you did a lot of things wrong. And then he said... You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. So I want you to watch what he's saying. You are spiritually dead, he says, and you are obeying the devil. And then he says these words. Pay attention. All of us used to live that way following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sin, sinful nature. In other words, 
We did whatever felt good, whatever we wanted to do. And then he says, by our very nature, Paul says, we were subject to God's anger or his wrath just like everyone else. So let me summarize this and see what he's really saying. The Apostle Paul is saying that without Christ, you are spiritually dead. Did you see that? That's what the Bible says. Not physically dead, or spiritually, but, but spiritually dead because of your disobedience to God. So, and he says, you are obeying the devil without Christ, and you are following your sinful desires, and you are subject to God's anger or his wrath. Let's be honest. When I see that, when I read about God's anger or about God's wrath, that makes me very nervous. And then he says that you are obeying the devil without Christ and you are following your sinful desires. But let's be honest, that's very confusing when we are at church and when, when you know, we love to preach about God's love or about loving, loving God. But this is when it gets a little complex. Question, how can we... Or how can a loving God also be an angry God? Let's be honest, that doesn't make sense, does it? How can a loving God be an angry God? And what I want to try to show you is that love and anger can unquestionably coexist. They can go together. And I'm going to give you an, an analogy. And I want to warn you. I'm going I'm to break it down because I'm going to dare to compare you with God. I mean, I know that's very risky. But the problem is, if you haven't noticed, you are not God. Can I get an amen? You are not, we are not God. So it, it does break down some, but it, it's, this is going somewhere. For instance, for those of you who are parents, how many would you say, I love my children? Until they disobey you. You love them, but you want to choke them, right? Okay, don't, don't quote me in that. Okay, so you love them, but they disobey you. So can you agree with me that you can simultaneously love him and want to spank him at the same time? Can we be honest? Can we be honest? Okay. For instance, can you love your friend, or maybe you love your friend, but you hate when, you know, he insists on driving and driving and, and drinking and driving, and that's really affecting his, his family and his life. Can, so basically we love him, but also we hate what he does, right? Okay, wives, think about your husband when you know that you love your husband so much, but when he doesn't pull, put the toilet lid down, something happens, right? You want to choke him. You love him. Come on, somebody. <laughs> so you might not love him at that very moment. And you're asking God to love him so, so many times. So can you see how love and anger can go together sometimes? Are you following me? And so when God is angry, so he can both love people and be angry at that which hurts his creation at the same time. And this is what Paul is talking about. And this is the, in the nuance. And, and he says that without Christ, he says, you are subject to his wrath. He is angry at the filth, at the, the horror, at the sin, that, that every, everything that goes against everything that goes against of his holiness. But I want you to see verse 4. This is what the Bible says. But God. But God. Somebody say. Somebody say. But God. So let, let's say it again. But God is so rich in what? But God is so rich in mercy. And he loved us so much that even when we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life. When he raised Christ from the dead, from the dead. And in other words, even though we deserve, I want you to pay attention to me. Even though we deserve to be punished because of God's rich mercy, he, we did not get what we deserve. 
If you are, are, if you are ever tempted to think, well, God is not fair, sometimes you need to say, I thank God he's not fair. Sometimes because if he was fair in our perspective, we would get what we deserve. And the Bible says that God is rich in mercy. In fact, that is rich. The, the word in Greek is the word elios, and that is in the present tense. So what that means is that God lives in a continual, ongoing state of mercy. Are you following me? He is merciful. It's an unending state of mercy. He is rich in mercy. It's continual. In other words, he, it, it's always been there, his love, his mercy. And that's why the Bible says that his mercies are new every morning. So here's a reason for you to wake up in the morning and say, God, I don't care about what I did to yesterday, but I know that your mercies are new today. And it will be new tomorrow because it does not end. It's always there. It's continual. It's unending. And it's abounding in, in rich mercy. And you may say, well, but wouldn't God like, a, like the, the, the kick off angry God in the, the Old Testament that, we, that he will strike people down dead, you know, when they will do bad things? And then when we go to a, and we see a loving God in the New Testament, no. That's, what, that's, that's when people get it wrong. He's always been just. He's always been merciful. He's always been righteous and he's always been loving. It's not like we have two different gods in the Bible, an angry God and a loving God. No, here's the problem. This is why so many people have the, the wrong <coughs> view of God. And, and let me just, again, and we're going to try to go a little deeper. Can you go deeper with me? You may be confusing, but that's deep. This is where people go wrong. So many people, they don't understand God because their view of God starts in Genesis chapter 3. And it ends in Revelation, Revelation chapter 20. And I don't know, if you don't know Genesis 3, that's when Adam and Eve, you know, the rest of the story, that's when they fell and that's when they sinned and they disobeyed God. And in Genesis 20, we see about the punishment, and that is the judgment, that is the eternal damnation. So for so many people, when they think about God, it, their theology is, you are a sinner, and you're going to hell. You are so pathetic, and you're going to hell. You fell short, and you're going to hell. You're not a good person, you're going to hell. That's all we preach in the church. And now, this is very risky, because I'm not saying that we are not sinful. But that's not what it starts. That's not where the story of God started. That's not actually when, when, when it started. And in the beginning, the Bible says, in Genesis chapter 1, that God created everything and he said, it's all good. It's all good. The oceans are good. The mountains are good. The skies are good. The birds are good. The fish are good. Let me take a break. The watermelons are good. And then the Bible says that he created people, and he did not say that they were good. He said, mankind are very good. And this is what it started. And it started with the goodness of God. Are you following me? It started with the goodness of God. And he said, this is just so good. Enjoy it all. Be naked. Multiply. Have fun. Let's have a party in the garden. Just don't eat of this tree. This is the one. And then we see that Adam and Eve, uh, they, they gave in to temptation and they, they ate that, from that one tree. And God said, if you eat of that, you sh you'll surely die. And the Bible says that they ate. But the question is, did they die? Did they die a physical death? No. The Bible says that they die a spiritual death. And so what did God do? Because he's, uh, some people say because he's a mean, judgmental, angry God, he struck him dead on the spot and made little black spots right there for the, by his first blade of grass. 
then you'll say, well, no, no, that's not what he did, Pastor. That's not what he did. He said, I'm sorry, there will be some consequences for what you did, and I got bad news for you. Childbirth, childbearing is going to be really, really hard, and you're going to work a lot. But that's, that's what's coming. There, there will be some consequences for what they did wrong. And now the question is, then what did God do in his mercy, in his love? The Bible says that, which are new every morning, that, that's, that has been there from the beginning. And it starts with his mercy. His mercy is new every morning. It was there at the very beginning. And it starts with his mercy and his goodness. And it goes all the way to Revelation chapter 21 and 22 when we see that God makes all things new again. It starts with good. It ends with good because his mercy is new every morning. Here's the thing. When you understand the mercy or the nature of God, yes, he's still just, but he is always merciful. Your only reasonable response in view of God's mercy is that we offer ourselves as living sacrifices. That's why we worship. He's always been good. He's always been good. Now here's the thing. I'm going to go a little deeper in the time that I have left. In the Old Testament, we see that David, David I'm sorry, David sinned. And we know what, he, what, what happened. And, and, and this is a different time. And we, we know that David actually was pretty good at sinning. He was one of the greatest kings in the Old Testament. But we, he, he, we, said, we see that he disobeyed God. And, but thankfully, God is a God of mercy. Amen? And this was a sin that could have had some pretty big consequences to a lot of people in the Old Testament. But I want you to watch. What David did. And what he did is that he wanted to turn to God. But I want you to watch who he didn't want to turn to. When he had done something wrong. And we, we find this in this, the book of 2 Samuel chapter 24 verse 14. And this, this is what he says. But let us fall into the hands of the Lord. Why? Why? For his mercy is great. In other words, he'll have mercy for my wrongdoing. Let me run to the God who is merciful. And then this is what he says, but do not let me fall into human hands. I think that's kind of funny. You know, I want to go to a merciful God because God may show mercy. But so many people. People won't. And am I telling you the truth? You know, isn't the church supposed to be the place where we show mercy to others? God may be a merciful God, but oh my gosh, you know, if you mess up, people will pile along. In fact, I mean, if you look at the Old Testament, there are the most ridiculous detailed descriptions of how God wanted his holy, he wanted his holy temple built, you know. And I don't know if you know this. I'm just going to read some descriptions. But, you know, the, the Bible says that and the holy temple would be his dwelling place. And you can read again and again and again. You know, it's, it's, it's so many details that you want to just skip the whole book in the Bible. And I, I know sometimes we ask the question, so why, God, why do you need to provide so many details and this is how you build a portico and, you know, here's the entry and here's the storeroom and here's the, the upper part and here's the, all the dimensions. And it can be this much and this much by this much and this long, you know, and here's the gold and here's the silver, here's the bronze. And you have all this kind of stuff. But this, pay attention to this. And then God says, in the middle of my house, what I want you to build is a place of atonement, a place of mercy. 
in the very middle of all the descriptive glory and beauty of my house, I want you to build a mercy seat. You know what God is saying? God is saying, in my house, I want you to always make room for mercy. He's saying, make room for mercy. It's the center of my house. It's the center of my heart. It's the core of who I am. Because with the birth of every new day, my mercy is already there, my friend. James was the one who said that mercy triumphs over judgment. So why is it that those people, those who call themselves Christians, who should be full of the most mercy, why? Because we have received the most mercy. So the question of why is that those who receive the most mercy are often the most judgmental. Well, God, please help us. Perhaps one of the biggest reasons why so many people stay away from God today is not because of who God is. You know where this is going. But because how we as Christians represent God. It's narrow-minded, hypocritical, judgmental Christian without mercy. And that's why, because we are people who have received mercy and we should be the most merciful, amen? We should be the most merciful, but what is our message? It is the message of Jesus. It is the message that Jesus Christ is knocking on the door, and that anyone, that means anyone, opens up. The Bible says that Jesus will come in. And that's an invitation for all of you. In other words, our message is come just as you are. Here's the thing, if you have questions about your faith, about the Bible, about God, this is a place for you. I don't want you to go anywhere else. This is a place when I'm hoping as a church we will be open, we will be ready to receive you with all your insecurities, with all your fears, with all your doubts and questions. We want to be able to sit down with you because there's always Room for mercy in the house of the Lord. And this is what the Apostle Paul wrote. He said these words, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. This is the reason, my friend, why we gather together to worship. Because we worship a merciful God. We love a merciful God, and this is our holy and acceptable act of worship. Some of you may say, well, I thank God for his mercy, but I'm still hurting, Pastor. This hurts so much. And I don't know about you, but this past, past couple of years, I have seen with my eyes more sadness, more anxiety, more fear, more stress than ever before in my life. I can, I'm not here to explain to you why God allowed COVID to happen. But maybe. Maybe it's time for you and for me to go back to our merciful God. To say, you know, Lord, I want to thank you for your love and your mercy. We say great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. And Father, I pray today that by the power of your spirit, Father, you will do a work in our church, that kind of work that only you can do. Father, I pray that you will speak to us 
God, move in our lives. Father, I, I ask that by your grace that we will come to you not with the Genesis 3 mindset, starting with our sinfulness, even though we know that we have sinned against you, against a holy God, but instead of Genesis 1 mindset, starting with your goodness, that you are good, and you let us come. And even when we failed because of your rich mercy, you sent Jesus for us. Father, so we trust you. Because you are the most trustworthy God. And you are always a good God. So, Father, we ask that you would meet whatever needs that we have. And, Father, we cast our burdens on you because you care for us. And, Father, we pray, we cry out to you. We bring our questions. We bring our doubts. We bring our fears. And, God, we choose to trust you for you are a good God. And would you, Father, at this moment, in a way that only you, Father, can do it, would you minister to us? To your people. Father, I pray that you will show us your grace, your goodness, your love, your compassion, your mercy that is new every day. Father, I pray that you will reveal yourself and we thank you, God, that you are exactly who you say you are, who you say you are, and you are a merciful God. And I, Father, I pray for those who maybe this is the day that they are considering coming to you to faith in Jesus Christ. I pray that you will move in a supernatural way, that you will draw us near to you, Father. And that today will be the day of salvation for many people. And I pray in the name that is of all names and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the people of God says with me amen hey everyone we're so glad you invited us into your living room today we hope to see you in person next time to stay up to date on all that's going on at our church throughout this week please visit getsemony.org we'll see you next time